Welcome back to this latest installment of the 12 Days in March review series for Step 1. This is Kieran Malur again, ready to introduce the second of our three-part video series focusing on the brachial plexus. Just like in Part 1, I'll cover all the high-yield information as well as tips and tricks to help you tackle whatever question comes at you on test day. In Part 1, we covered the long thoracic and musculocutaneous nerves. In Part 2 today, we'll be tackling the axillary and radial nerves both terminal branches of the posterior cord and nerves that I like to think go hand in hand and are easy to remember together. As always, this is gonna be a good one, let's jump in. And here again is the brachial plexus diagram introduced in part one. As you can see from our roadmap, the axillary nerve contains nerve roots from the C5 to C6 ventral rami and is a branch of the posterior cord. The axillary nerve courses posteriorly through the quadrangular space accompanied by the posterior humeral circumflex artery. This is a high yield association because injury to the axillary nerve at the axilla may also damage this artery. If you recall from the rotator cuff video, the axillary nerve innervates the teres minor of the rotator cuff and is responsible for externally rotating the arm. It also innervates the deltoid, which abducts the arm from 15 to 90 degrees. The axillary nerve provides cutaneous innervation for the posterior lateral portion of the shoulder. This area is often referred to as the regimental badge area, as soldiers would often wear their military insignia based on their regiment here. Injury to the axillary nerve is most commonly seen with fractures at the surgical neck of the humerus, as well as with anterior inferior dislocations of the humerus. Injury to the axillary nerve results in loss of abduction after 15 degrees and weakened external rotation of the arm. You'll also lose posterior lateral upper arm sensation over the regimental insignia area. A flattened deltoid will also be characteristic of an axillary nerve injury. That's all you have to know for the axillary nerve. Let's summarize. When you see or hear axillary nerve, think shoulder. It innervates the deltoid and teres minor responsible for abduction and external rotation of the shoulder. It provides sensation for the posterior lateral aspect of the shoulder. And remember, Vascular injuries can happen with surgical neck fractures. The next stop on our journey through the posterior cord is the radial nerve. The radial nerve derives from the nerve roots of C5 to T1. Can you recall what other nerve that we just reviewed was also a continuation of the posterior cord? Yes siree, the axillary nerve. But remember, the axillary nerve has roots from C5 to C6. The radial nerve courses posteriorly along the humerus in a shallow depression called the radial groove. The nerve wraps around the humerus laterally to supply the medial head of the triceps, responsible for arm extension at the elbow. The nerve travels anterior to the lateral epicondyle before entering the forearm and terminating into a deep and superficial branch. The radial nerve provides motor innervation for the posterior or extensor compartment of the arm, all of which help extend the wrist, finger joints, and supinate the forearm. For this reason, the radial nerve is often called the great extensor nerve of the arm. It also provides sensory innervation to the posterior arm, posterior forearm, and dorsal surface of the lateral three and a half digits. Injury to the radial nerve can either be proximal, or high up in the arm, or distal, along the midarm corresponding to the radial groove. Proximal refers to an injury of the nerve near the axilla, and will be often described on step one in situations of excessive pressure from a badly fitting crutch or Saturday night palsy. Distal injuries are often described in the setting of mid-shaft humeral fractures. Very high yield for step one is that all radial nerve injuries will produce a classic wrist drop from loss of wrist, finger, and thumb extension. If the damage to the radial nerve is high enough, you may have triceps weakness as well, and the patient in your vignette will have difficulty with extension of the arm at the elbow. So to summarize, remember the radial nerve runs posteriorly and innervates the posterior arm, forearm, and dorsal three and a half digits of the hand. As the great extensor nerve, it innervates the extensor compartment muscles of the forearm and helps extend the thumb. When you think about the radial nerve, think posterior and extension. Let's try to tackle a question. We have a gent here who had an unfortunate run-in with a bull. He now has weakness with shoulder abduction and wrist and arm extension. So let's remember what nerves are responsible for these functions. Abduction of the shoulder? Well, that's the axillary nerve. How about wrist extension and arm extension? That's the radial nerve, aka the great extensor. So now that we know the two nerves involved here, 
the board examiners are asking us what's the relationship between the two. Remember, these nerves are related because they're both branches of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. And so the correct answer here is B. This question also highlights how examiners like to use the brachial plexus injuries to test your understanding of pathoanatomy. If you keep this in mind, their test mischief is very predictable. And that concludes part two. We're almost at the finish line, my friends. Please stick around and tune in for the third and final installment of the series. See you soon. This is Kieran Malour signing off.